Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today as we share important information about this latest round of challenges to so-called purely public charities. This morning, you will hear from City Solicitor Krisha Kubiak, who will provide information regarding the latest round of appeals that the City has filed with the Allegheny County Office of Property Assessments. You will also hear from three national experts who are joining us via Zoom, Daniel Bird, Emily Gee, and Emily Hanauer. Mayor Ganey will then close out this morning's press conference and afterwards we will take your questions. If you have questions that are unrelated to the topics at hand today, I ask that you hold those until after the conversation around the challenges and we'll take those afterwards. It is now my honor to invite the solicitor for the city of Pittsburgh up to the podium, Krisha Kubiak. Good morning. My name is Krisha Kubiak, and I am the solicitor for the City of Pittsburgh. This week, the City is filing our second set of challenges to the tax status on parcels in our nonprofit property tax review. There are 900 par uh, 940 parcels in the City of Pittsburgh that have a charitable exempt status. Last year at this time, we had reviewed 10%. As of today, we have reviewed 62%. This week, we will be filing 104 challenges. During the last year, we've gained a deeper understanding about the nonprofits in our region and the legal support for our position. There is an old saying, the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. The second best time is today. This is a process that should have been done in previous years, but now it, is, it will be done regularly, consistently, and into the future. We will continue to challenge the parcels that are either not being used for their charitable purpose or are not owned by purely public charities. Our department has used a consistent set of principles to review the publicly available information on the parcels and the nonprofits that own them. Our principles are derived from the Hub test and the jurisprudence that has followed that Supreme Court case. The parcels we have challenged today can be characterized into three categories. First, we are challenging parcels that are owned by private corporations or entities that have lost their 501c3 status. This is just a basic good government cleanup operation and those parcels should be returned to the taxable roles. Second, there are the parcels that belong to a nonprofit but are not being used for a charitable purpose. They are a parking lot, a vacant lot that isn't being developed, an abandoned building with no clear purpose. Charities can have both taxable and exempt properties and these par parcels are improperly characterized. Third, there are the parcels that do not belong to a purely public charity. Those parcels may continue to trials in the Court of Common Pleas, and that process will take time. But as I said, when the city prevails on those cases, the tax bills will be dated from the date that we filed the challenge. How did the city make the determination on which parcels to challenge? We use case law as our guide. One question that prior courts have asked is, how much do the executives get paid? Some of our nonprofits, the ones that are purely public charities, are serving the community with limited revenues and with dedicated staff who are clearly making less than they would make if they were in the private sector. For example, the Pittsburgh Glass Center has multiple robust programs for all of the people in Pittsburgh with limited re revenues and limited expenses, with an executive director that, who is clearly doing this for the passion of the work. They support both full-time artists and a diverse set of regular people and children who are interested in learning more about making glass art. They sponsor a residency program to help artists find dedicated time and studio space to make art. On the other side of the equation, there are nonprofits that are paying their executives millions of dollars annually. In fact, many of their executives are paid more than comparable positions in the private sector. Executive compensation is not the only standard, but it is consistently one of the factors that courts have looked at in determining whether an organization is a purely public charity. Some of the other questions that we are asking are the following. How many of their services are free or reduced price? How much of their revenue is based on fees as opposed to donations? Who are the people that they are serving? Is there a for-profit company that does something similar 
pays their people similar salary and charges similar rates? Is most of their revenue coming from the government? And importantly, how much of a profit is the organization making? The city is basing its review on publicly available information. We acknowledge that with some of these organizations, we might be wrong. My door is open to people who want to discuss a challenge to their property and want to establish for us outside of court that they are using their property for a charitable purpose or that the facts that we based our determination on don't tell the whole story. Even last year, we withdrew our challenges on three parcels in a simple process. They sent us the proper paperwork and we were satisfied. In light of that, we, this year we have flagged some parcels, not the ones that we are challenging this week, for the need for additional information. We are starting a new process with these, for those parcels that are on the fence where we will be reaching out to the property owner and asking them to provide more information. If they can establish that they are purely public charities and their parcels are being used for that work, we will not file challenges on those parcels. We have 352 parcels left to review. As another change to assist my staff with their workload, we will be filing challenges at the end of every month instead of waiting until next year's deadline. It will not move the process any faster with the county, but it will start to move us into a phase where this process just becomes part of our daily work. This is not a project with which we will ever be done. Although we will be finished with our first review of all parcels by next year, new parcels request tax exempt status constantly. Nonprofits sell their parcels to taxable entities every year. What happens on these parcels changes every year. The city commits to this work long term so that, to quote the mayor, everyone pays their fair share. I've heard from people at cocktail parties that the city should not be challenging some of these nonprofits because they are large employers. My position on that is that we are grateful to them for employing people, just as we are grateful to PNC and to Giant Eagle. Those corporations also hire a lot of people in Pittsburgh. They are good corporate citizens. They also own property here, and they pay their taxes on the parcels that they own. I hear the complaint that this will take too long to help the city. I'd like to remind everyone that the city of Pittsburgh ended the year of 2023 in the black in the amount of $67 million. It is not time to panic. This project we are discussing today is only one part of an overall strategy to put the city on stronger financial ground. It is not an overnight fix. Honestly, there are no real overnight fixes, but it will still make a significant difference. A taxpayer has a right to due process, to file their appeals into their day in court. I believe in the justice system of the county and the correct decision will eventually prevail. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart once said, swift justice demands more than just swiftness. It is important to remember that the clock on the taxable calculation starts to tick as soon as we file the challenge. So even if the payments are delayed, we will get everything that we are owed to us in due time. I am confident that the city has an extremely strong case to make in court. As a litigator, I am also not intimidated by this process. The, the length is common in litigation, especially in situations like this, where there are administrative hearings that must be completed before we get to the state trial court. We don't do this work for this year alone. We do this work like we do all of our work here, for the good of the city of Pittsburgh, both for now and for the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Solicitor. Up next is Daniel Bird. Daniel Bird is a litigation partner at Kellogg, Hansen, Todd, Figgle, and Frederick PLLC. He has extensive experience and knowledge related to the Hub Test, and most recently published the article, Wayward Samaritans, Nonprofit Hospitals, and Their Tax-Exempt Status in the University of Pittsburgh Law Review. Good morning, and thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna say a few words to give an overview of Pennsylvania's fairly unique legal framework that applies in the context of tax exempt entities. And that framework really has three, three pieces that I wanna to touch on. There's a constitutional provision, there are some statutory provisions, and then there's a fairly unique procedural mechanism. So first on the constitutional provision, 
I promise I'll be brief, but prior to 1873, tax exemptions were handed out in Pennsylvania through special legislative grants, and they were subject to favoritism and abuse. And so in 1873, Pennsylvania adopted a constitutional provision that required tax exemptions to be granted by general laws rather than special legislation. And so Article 8, Section 2 of the Pennsylvania Constitution provides that the General Assembly may by law exempt from taxation institutions of purely public charity. That is the key phrase, and it comes right out of the Constitution. And then the provision goes on to say that in the case of any real property, tax exemptions can only be granted to the portion of real property that is actually and regularly used for the purposes of the institution. Now, for about 100 years after that provision was adopted, Pennsylvania courts worked to define the meaning of a purely public charity for all sorts of institutions. And so there are cases from the 19th and 20th centuries dealing with the libraries, fire insurance patrol of Philadelphia, there's an Episcopal school case, local YMCAs, hospitals, and so forth. And then in 1985, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decided a fairly seminal case called Hospital Utilization Project versus Commonwealth. That's the, the origin of what uh, is referred to as the HUP test. And the case concerned the tax exempt status of the Hospital Utilization Project, which was a company formed and funded by nonprofit hospitals and that company provided statistical analysis of patient treatment and cost data to hospitals and other healthcare providers. And the Supreme Court concluded that HUP was not exempt from taxation. It was not a purely public charity. And in doing so, it surveyed all of its public, uh, purely public charity cases from the prior century and landed on the five factors that are currently referred to as the HUP test. And those five factors, all of which must be satisfied by any entity that wants to be deemed a purely public charity, are that it advances a charitable purpose, that it donates or renders gratuitously a substantial portion of its services, that it benefits a substantial and indefinite class of persons who are legitimate subjects of charity, that it relieves the government of some of its burden, and finally, that it operates entirely free from private profit motive. That's the HUP test. It's endured for 40 years, and it remains the constitutional standard for any entity that wishes to be considered a purely public charity. Now, a brief word on some relevant statutes that apply in Pennsylvania. The first is Act 55. It's, it's typically called Act 55. It's, it's actually the Institutions of Purely Public Charity Act. It was passed by the General Assembly in 1997. And it was intended to eliminate what the General Assembly perceived as being inconsistent application of eligibility standards for charitable tax exemptions and reduce confusion throughout the state. And it actually provides five factors that roughly track the HUP factors, and it gives specific rules about how institutions can satisfy that. Uh, but in 2012, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court made clear that the statutes are the work of the legislature, but interpreting the Constitution is the work of the Supreme Court. And so these are separate regimes, even though there is overlap. The HUP test is the test for the constitutional standard of what is a purely public charity. And now, as a result of Act 55, there is a separate but overlapping uh, set of factors uh, that also must be satisfied. And as the Supreme Court said, uh, if you do not qualify under the HUP test, you never get to the statute. So it's an additional requirement that must be satisfied. And then you also have the consolidated county assessment laws. And there's two different statutory schemes that control the assessment of real property and exemptions from taxation in the various counties, depending on how populous they are. So there's a one statute for smaller populated counties. And then there's another, the general county assessment law that controls the assessment of real property in counties with larger populations. And that's the one that applies in Allegheny County. And there are additional specific rules that organizations must follow for their property to be tax exempt under that under those statutes. And the effect, the bottom line kind of effect of all these requirements is that for property to be tax exempt, it must be owned by a purely public charity. And the specific property at issue must actually and regularly be used for the purpose of that institution. And so the, to the extent that a property or a part of property is not used to advance the charity's purpose, that portion of property is not tax exempt. And so you can actually have cases that talk about some portion of the square footage or different floors of a building and what are they used for? And you know, also it's not enough that a charity simply generates revenue that it uses for charitable purposes. You can't have a charity that say owns a golf course and say, well, we use all the money from the golf course for our charitable purposes. 
there has to be a connection between the purpose of the use of the property and the charity's overall purpose. And just, I'll give a brief word about the process um, and how this plays out um, in, in the legal framework. Pennsylvania is quite unique from other states in that th this is not a framework that's controlled by you know, the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue. Each taxing district can appeal a property tax assessment to the County Board of Property Assessment Appeals and Review. And that typically happens uh, on an annual basis. Now, once that administrative hearing happens, the loser can appeal to the Court of Common Pleas, which is Pennsylvania's trial court of general jurisdiction. Again, if there's a loser in that court, they can appeal to the Commonwealth Court. And ultimately, someone who loses in the Commonwealth Court can petition the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to review uh, the case. And uh, the last thing I'll say about this is that it is a very unique process. Almost no other state has a process like that. Um, and so Pennsylvania's uh, both the kind of the legal standards and the process that it allows uh, for challenges to tax exempt status are, are fairly unique in our country. Thanks. Thank you very much, Daniel. Up next is Emily Gee. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Ganey and Solicitor Kubiak for inviting me to be part of this conference. My name is Emily G, and I'm an economist and senior vice president for inclusive growth at the Center for American Progress. I'm here to speak about the trade-offs that occur for cities, taxpayers, and communities when tax exempt entities do not live up to their charitable missions. Across the nation, charities perform essential societal functions like providing education, and they frequently fill gaps in the social safety net by ensuring that people's basic needs like shelter, food, and health care are met. Many organizations in Pittsburgh serve charitable missions, including providing world-class medical care, even for those without the means to pay, enriching our lives through faith and the arts, educating students and providing workforce training, and conducting cutting-edge research that advances science and medical technology. In return for the contributions to society, charities receive tax exemptions at multiple levels of government. But the hard truth is that there is some cost to tax exemptions. Foregone tax property revenue represents dollars that could go to supporting city services like schools, roadways, parks, affordable housing, and social programs that support the well-being of our neighbors and our communities. Tax exemptions essentially allow entities to put foregone tax dollars towards whatever they deem a suitable charitable purpose, and that may not necessarily align with communities' most urgent needs. To put this into perspective, in 2021, the Pittsburgh tax exemptions for property belonging to the big five largest tax exempt organizations were equivalent to $34.5 million. That's enough to pay the median salary for a Pittsburgh public schools teacher 500 times over. And also keep in mind that tax exempt institutions are also beneficiaries of, of municipal services like water and sanitation, transit, sidewalks and roads and emergency services. They also benefit indirectly via public programs that make the city an, enjoy an enjoyable place to live for their employees, clients, students, or patients. Tax dollars make these city provided public goods possible. But Pittsburgh's largest nonprofits own more tax exempt property than they did a decade ago. And cities across the nation face uncertainty over revenues and commercial property values because the COVID-19 pandemic has shifted how and where Americans work. In a democracy, public money should serve the interests of the public. Citizens deserve a say in how public resources, including our tax dollars, are used, as well as the means to hold institutions accountable. That's why we have public hearings, elected city councils, and school boards. The public services needed to keep a major city like Pittsburgh thriving are not possible without a reliable tax base, and charity alone cannot provide all of that on the scale and with the coordination needed to serve a whole city. So I applaud Mayor Ganey for seeing that tax exempt institutions are for seeing that tax exempt institutions are following the law and paying their fair share for property holdings that aren't serving a charitable mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Up next is Amy Hanauer. Thank you so much for having me. I promise you I have a background. Um, I have an office that's every bit as professional as Dan's, but I'm calling in from a car coming back from actually a speaking engagement in, at Juniata College in Pennsylvania. 
and um, thanks so much for having me. Um, I am the executive director of the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, which is really the premier national nonprofit that conducts rigorous analyses of state and local tax systems. So we've built a reputation based on high quality, reliable tax modeling. We provide fact-based analysis and recommendations to shape equitable and sustainable tax systems. So I want to just kind of remind the audience that the starting point when considering Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh's tax system is a, is a really inequitable um, starting point. And I'll this in the chat after I stop speaking, but um, at my organization, we do a report on state and local tax systems called Who Pays, which is a signature report used by organizations all over the country, including the Keystone Research Center in Pennsylvania, and by lawmakers and journalists all over the country to understand the equity or inequity of their state and local tax codes. And our seventh edition of this report, which was released earlier this year, found that 44 of the news, 50 state and local tax systems exacerbate inequality. So incomes are even more unequal after collection of state and local taxes. A big reason for this is that two of the main state and local taxes, sales taxes and property taxes, are regressive. The rich pay substantially less as a share of their income in sales and property taxes than do typical families. The solution to this is a progressive or graduated income tax, which can offset regressive sales and property taxes. That does not happen in Pennsylvania, which has a flat income tax. Um, and so for that reason, Pennsylvania actually has the fourth most regressive state and local tax system in the nation. And again, I'll drop this in the chat when I'm done speaking. So as a share of income, the bottom fifth of um, the, the lowest earning fifth of Pennsylvanians pay 15.1% of their income in state and local taxes, while the top 1% of Pennsylvanians pay only 6% of their income in state and local taxes. This is an upside down state tax code um, and state and local tax code. And we would urge state lawmakers to take this on. But it means that in many localities, um, they're relying also on inequitable tax codes, and that includes the Pittsburgh City and Pittsburgh School District. Here, the local income tax is even more regressive. The reason for that is because nearly all of that income comes from working families in the, in the form of wages and salaries, and that's taxed at a combined 3% income tax rate imposed by the city and school district in Pittsburgh. Well, the income that goes primarily to the wealthiest in Pittsburgh, including dividends, capital gains, and interest, is not taxed. For this reason, the top 1% in Pittsburgh pay only 0.4% of their income in, in taxes, about half the rate paid by middle-income taxpayers. So given this starting point, even before the pandemic, a central public policy challenge in Pennsylvania and in Pittsburgh it has been achieving a more equitable state and local tax system. Obviously, the pandemic increased the urgency of, of, of you know, advancing these goals. And one reason is the focus of today's discussion, which has been really interesting to sit in on. And that's the decline in commercial real estate property values in the wake of increased teleworking and plunging commercial office building vacancy rates um, or soaring vacancy rates, I should say. Um, we, you know, all over the country, this is likely to reduce commercial real estate property tax payments. And so um, as the American Rescue Plan dollars, which did so much to protect communities um, through this downfall, as, as those are winding down, declining commercial property taxes create a real need to figure out new revenue streams to avoid cuts in services or increases in local tax rates for families. So the need for local tax revenue is not, of course, unique to Pennsylvania. Far from it, the decline in commercial property values that I'm describing has hit other cities even harder than Pittsburgh, and the end of American Rescue Plan funding is hitting almost every city in America. So this brings us to what are we going to do about it, and I... Um, applaud you for looking into new solutions. The Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy is developing a more comprehensive set of options for cities to equitably, equitably replace revenue lost to fall in commercial property tax collections. Um, and so asking a large and growing educational and medical nonprofit community to contribute more to city revenue is an option with the potential to generate significant revenue. And I know that this has been looked at all over the country. 
It's also really in the self-interest of Pittsburgh's universities and healthcare institutions, because that self-interest hinges on a thriving city, one with a budget sufficient to ensure public safety, affordable housing, quality education, attractive parks, cultural and other amenities, some of which Emily alluded to. Um, I think it's it's just really important that that these entities be able to hire well-trained workers, and they're only going to be able to do that locally if you have a good tax system that is generating the revenue to, to provide those things. So I'm going to close with an offer. In partnership with the Keystone Research Center, my organization, ITEP, has already been able to provide Pittsburgh with an analysis of the promising revenue potential and highly desirable equity features of the fairer Pittsburgh income tax. And I can drop this in the chat afterwards. But looking forward, we really welcome the opportunity to work further with the city and with Keystone Research Center to help Pittsburgh raise revenue equitably and to continue um, your progress toward a Pittsburgh for all. Thanks very much for the opportunity to testify from my car today or to speak from my car today. And I look forward to hearing more. It is now my distinct honor to introduce the mayor of the great city of Pittsburgh, the Honorable Ed Ganey. Good morning. I want to thank everybody for joining me today. As we take our next steps in the review of the nonprofit tax exempt property. Last year, I ordered my law and finance department to begin working on an audit of all our property that belongs to purely public charities. In addition, their hard and diligent work means that so far we have completed a review of over 60% of all non-city owned properties. Including these challenges are vacant lots, empty buildings, parking lots, as well as parcels owned by entities that no longer or have lost their 501c3, 501, 501c3 tax status. Our list today includes properties owned by some of the biggest and largest nonprofits here in Pittsburgh, including UPMC, AHN, and our universities. Over the past year, I've heard from countless number of individuals who have asked, what are you doing to make sure everyone is paying their fair share to our city? I made a promise that I would do the work necessary to make sure that if you do not meet the standards as set forth by the Constitution, that you would pay your fair share to our city. We are here today to make sure our city has the resources it needs to pave our roads, pick up the snow, open our pools, and give our residents the services they truly deserve. It means that if you do not meet the standard as defined by the Supreme Court, that you shall pay your fair share for the paving of the roads in front of your hospitals, to the EMS crews that bring patients to your doors, for the police and fire teams that help keep you and your students safe, and for the DPW, Department of Public Works crew, who picks up the garbage and makes sure that our bridge operates so that our economy has the ability to thrive. That's what we're here for today, and I will take any questions that you may have. Rick? Mayor, of the um, properties that you challenged last year, I think there were 10 or so that you challenged last year. We challenged 26 properties of that. Many, yeah. Can you tell me how many, you, how many of those cases you won and how much money that has brought in? Got two people that'll speak to you, Rick. So um, out of the 27 parcels that we challenged last year, the county found in our favor for 12 of them. 12 of them they did not find in our favor, and we have filed appeals on those. And three of them w were the ones we withdrew. Um, last year, and Jen may correct me, but I believe last year, based on the 2023 taxes, we brought in about $100,000. On those we're 12. Okay. We're doing $100,000. Right, but we should be doing this more. We should be doing this every year. This is something that we should be looking at every single year. Jake, you want to speak to the budget of that? Want to speak to the budget? Not on the revenue okay. side. Okay. Jake, do you have anything to add? No, actually, Krisha was correct. Okay. And, and you are correct that this is something we should be doing every year. Okay. And, and, and now, this year, you're challenging several hundred? 104. 104, and how, what's the potential revenue there? 
Nearly seven million. Nearly seven million. Um, for the city, that is a potential revenue of $6.5 million. When you combine the city, the school district, um, parks, and library taxes, that becomes over $14 million. Charlie? For that $6 million, is that something the city needs or is counting on to have a balanced budget in future years? Uh, no. The, I, I think I'll just echo the mayor and the solicitor when I say that the purpose of these challenges first and foremost is fairness and uh, ensuring that the taxes we collect and the tax burden that applies in the city is distributed based on the, uh, the standards in the Constitution and ensuring that everyone's fair share is being paid to support our services generally. The, uh, the city ended 2023 with a significant surplus, as the solicitor mentioned. Um, in general, I think recent discussions about our, uh, the state of the city's finances, while we are certainly uh, keeping a watchful eye on trends as property tax appeals um, come in, and with the end of ARPA funds, I, I still think that some of those concerns have been overstated, um, and many of the shifts in revenue have been uh, taken into account in our current financial forecasts that underpinned the 2023, I'm sorry, the 2024 budget. Um, also on that same line, um, we retain, as uh, Standard & Poor's and Fitch uh, uh, noted in their recent uh, at reaffirmation of our bond ratings, significant ability to control spending within our current financial practices. So um, if we are to experience revenue shortfalls that are within the parameters that we uh, you know, can reasonably anticipate this year, we have ample tools to uh, adjust spending within the current budget to prevent any, um, any of those changes from uh, having a significant impact on services. So we are not um, seeking these judgments to address any immediate budget gap or uh, close a hole or, or stave off an impending challenge, but rather to ensure that for the long-term success of the city of Pittsburgh and the long-term thriving of its residents, that our tax system is based on an accurate and fair understanding of who should be paying what. Okay. Any additional revenue is good for the city. These projections are based on current property values. Do you have any estimate about how much that changes if there is a broader reassessment? It would go up significantly. Um, you know, we, we're confident that these assessment, the, the reassessment of many of the, particularly the larger properties that are included um, in this round of appeals could significantly increase their liability, uh, their tax liability, based on um, either improvements since their prior uh, assessment or just generally market dynamics since that time. Um, we're, we're operating under the, the current framework um, applied by the county based on the current reassessment, and that's where these figures are generated from. Bob? This approach that you're taking here, which is making the most of, taking it literally property by property to address this, uh, is working within the existing rules and, and laws. Are you also considering at any point any broader uh, legal challenge as past administrations have done, in addition to what you're doing <coughs> here, to, uh, to challenge the, uh, the application of tax laws to uh, nonprofits? One of the important things for a government is to be able to treat everyone equally. And this process where we are examining every exempt parcel that belongs to, that has a charitable exemption. Make sure that we are treating every property owner the same. Um, the concerns about past legal um, filings with the court were about kind of an unequal um, uh, focus on certain organizations. And I will say the city is is making sure that they are doing what the city tries to do, which is treat everyone fairly, especially when it comes to taxes. And let me be clear, we, our door is still open. We're still having conversations with the nonprofits. I know a lot of y'all were wondering if we were still talking to nonprofits. The reality is we is. I just met with UPMC about a week ago. Now, I won't talk about the discussion between me, you, and you, me, you, UPMC. Then we won't negotiate that in public. But we are talking to nonprofits. We continue to talk to nonprofits, and um, hopefully we'll have something in return. Are you, are you talking to them about 
UPMC or anyone about pilot agreements, potentially? We're having a conversation about how we can come to an agreement. In, in years past, there have been uh, programs of voluntary uh, contributions. Are, is any version of that still surviving and in place, or is, are, on an annual basis, any voluntary uh, contribution jointly for any sort of fund or individually by the major uh, nonprofits? I have no yes, yes. So, yeah. so I think you're referencing the former one PGH fund. Right. Uh, the so-called $40 million in that fund wasn't actual money coming into the general operating fund for the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, so there was no real money there to help us do the things like pave the roads and open the pools. Uh, however, we are engaging in conversations with our nonprofit partners about what an agreement can look like. Chris? Yeah, um, is there any additional cost to taxpayers with filing these appeals, or is this all stuff that's covered by the general public? How do we, like, is there any extra cost, essentially, with doing all this? We have a outside counsel that um, we that help us build kind of the legal strategy and for legal advice. But most of this work is done within my own um, shop. So we, um, a couple of our uh, uh, law interns that have uh, that work with us, do a lot of work. We have six attorneys who are reviewing these par um, the the case law and these parcels on a regular basis, and certainly all of the people in the finance department who've been of huge assistance to us as well. So most of this work is being done in house. We are trying to get ourselves up to speed, and then hopefully we will always end up being able to do all of this in house. You talked about a timeline for doing. Well, you didn't have like for doing this all in-house, I guess that's my question. We hired this outside law firm, uh, which costs taxpayers money. Do you think next year the city will be able to do this on its own? I, it really depends on which where the cases go and how much and the timing. Even now, um, if there are times when we have so many cases that come into the law department, we seek outside help because um, of capacity issues. Sometimes we can handle it all, sometimes we can't handle it all. So that's going to be the same for this situation. Sure. Did you have any, Julia, did you have anything? Without side counsel, you're referring to... Hold on, Rick, 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 Rick. 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 We'll Thank you. Uh, you. You had mentioned that there are several properties from last year that are still going through the appeals process. Correct. There's a timeline on getting a final verdict. Yeah, there's no timeline at this point. Rick? Um, you, you referred to outside counsel as the load and load? Yeah, that's correct. In the contract for, what was it, 400, cash, 400,000? Correct. Any of those people that joined us today, would they pay for any of your services? No. No. Kelly? You said there were a number of parcels that are in this uh, unknown category that are on the fence. Um, do you have yeah. a number for that? Um, I don't have a number. We've been. We'll get back to you on that. We'll get back to you on yeah. that. One more question. There were 12 last year where they ruled in your favor but were appealed. Correct. Is that right? Um, I, I, honestly, I, I can't speak to how many of those were appealed. I didn't have that, that paperwork, so I'm not aware of which ones were appealed out of that. Um, those were parcels. Some of them were smaller. Some of them were parcels that were owned um, by uh, Pitt and CMU. Good. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>